Hello and welcome to today's Scrum Pulse. My name is Dave West. I'm going to be your host and moderator for today's session. And thank you for taking the time out of your busy, uh, busy days, uh, or maybe it's your summer holidays if you're uh, if you're lucky to be on that to listen to today's Scrum Pulse. And it's a really exciting Scrum Pulse. Uh, we have two who you can see uh, amazing presenters that are going to be uh, discussing some of the topics around um, leadership and management in the the future of work work kind of setting. Um, but before we begin that and before you, I introduce you to these two, uh, two, two people, first I'd like to um, go through some housekeeping. Oh, and by the way, my name's Dave West. I'm CEO and product owner here at Scrum.org. I almost forgot to mention my own name there. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, uh, and as you can tell from my delivery, I'm not used to moderating uh, webinar, so I apologise. Please bear with me. Uh, I'm 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 still still learning. So some um, stuff. You'll be muted, unfortunately. Um, we would love to hear your voices, but uh, the the opportunity for dogs barking, uh, ambulances, fire engines, explosions, I don't know. You, you never know. You know what it's like on conference calls. Uh, so we're muted. However, that does not stop you from being able to contribute and collaborate on today's uh, webinar. Please ask questions. There's a little question. You'll see me looking down because you're on my big screen and my my um, go to webinar thing is on on my right so i apologize if you see me looking down but as you can see from the um, from the the go to webinar app you will see that there's a questions tab please feel free to use that questions tab type in your questions and uh, i'm i'm monitoring it i can see it now um so uh, you, you know we can we can hopefully answer them um there's probably quite a few people on today's webinar, so I'm not sure we're going to get to every question that you have, uh, but I'll, I will really do my best to uh, to bring those to the attention of our fantastic uh, speakers. If you've got any technical problems, um, please feel free to uh, also use the the question type thing, and one of our fabulous operators will hopefully be able to help you. It'll probably be something as simple as log out, switch your computer off, switch it back on, and log back in. But I don't want to uh, steal their thunder. Um, and of course, you know you can also use the chat box uh, if there's anything particular you want to want to chat. Now there is two very important points I want to raise before, which is always the first set of questions before I we start today's webinar. One is this um, webinar is being recorded. Uh, you will be sent a link afterwards that will allow you to pass this to to any friends or, or family or, or people that you know that, that you want to share this information with. And also the slides will be. Available as well. The slides are actually, though the emphasis really isn't slides, it's more of a discussion today. The slides uh, that um, that, that uh, Ralph and Kurt put together are pretty awesome. So there's lots of stuff in there that we we won't show as a slide today, but you'll be able to use later on. So they'll be available as well. So that should be the logistics. I probably missed something. As I say, I'm not very good at this, but feel free to use the comment or the uh, question box to ask any additional questions that you have and somebody will be able to put me right or put you right. But now, so let's move on to actually what we're here for. Um, so we're very fortunate today. We've got two amazing um, speakers. We've got Ralph von Van Roselman, uh, which I obviously did a horrible job. I am, I, as you can tell, I am not Dutch. He is Dutch. Uh, he, he's uh, basically the CEO and leader of uh, of, of of Management 3.0 or the organisation behind Management 3.0, which is we're fantastic. He's obviously written some amazing books and um, does a lot of content development uh, over the last. Uh, I guess it's over a year, Ralph, that we've been talking. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. He definitely approaches the world in a very similar way to myself and, and to, I think, all of Scrum.org, uh, which is which is great. And he's speaking to us from the Netherlands, which isn't apparently Amsterdam. Do you want to say hi there, Ralph? Ah, uh, yes, indeed. The Netherlands is bigger than just Amsterdam, as most people think. <laughs> um, it was a great introduction. I mean, covered everything uh, in the Netherlands, uh, 102. Fahrenheit today, 40 degrees below, so it's warm. Um, and it's a pleasure being here. I mean, I love to talk about this topic. Uh, I love to talk, talking about management and leadership. So uh, happy to do this together with you guys. 
Yeah, it's great. Great to have you here, Ralph. And and it's interesting, just to put a little bit of context, over the last, uh, I, I guess it is over a year, actually, it's probably 18 months now, we've been increasingly talking with the with Management 3.0 people, experts, facilitators, and obviously Ralph, uh, about the, the intersection between Scrum and the, the future of leadership or management, you know, management next generation 3.0. And it's just interesting, hopefully we're able to bring out some of those really interesting talking points as we move through the discussion. Um, we're also very fortunate to have somebody that I've known for over 20 years now, which is embarrassing to say, uh, Kurt Bittner. Um, he, he's got 370 years of experience. <laughs> Sorry, no, 37 years of experience. Um, um, he's been it, feels <laughs> it feels like 370, he said. Um, when I actually met Kurt, he was leading the RUP organization and some other parts of the rational organization and and I worked for him as the product manager for the Rational Unified process and I was always struck by his by 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 two things about Kurt one is his his is just his common sense you know that everything ultimately is his solutions are all just very very practical and well you know why 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 use all these long words it's just this very simple solution the other thing is the amount of disasters he's experienced oh sorry the amount of experience that he's had which he always manages to find something like that happened in i don't know 1876 or something when he was when he was in his middle age um and uh so i'm very fortunate to have him obviously he's written a lot of books some of them with me which uh, which i think i'm very grateful for because he's a fabulous writer and he's part of our um our, our organization here at scrum.org. Uh, Kurt, do you want to say hello to the audience, please? Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, to, to paraphrase or to sum up Dave's comment, there's this um, great quote. I, I think I maybe read it in um, Fred Brooks Mythical Man Month, but it's something like good judgment comes from experience, most of which comes from bad judgment. So uh, <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, I've, I've made lots of mistakes and therefore maybe I've learned something from a few of them. Um, yeah, so it's, it's exciting to be here, and um, this is also the, the main topic that interests me these days, um, because I think we've, I think we're, we've all gotten pretty good at, at working at the team level and helping a team, you know, basically working as a scrum team or a self-organizing agile team, and as long as all the issues are within that team, things go pretty well, but as many of you have probably found, once you start dealing with issues outside of that team, then things can go horribly wrong. So we're going to talk about the role of, of management and leadership, and the two, two things are different um, today about what they can do to help uh, solve those kinds of problems. Yeah. I think it's interesting. One of the reasons why I brought Kurt into Scrum.org is because of that very reason. You know, our mission here at Scrum.org, um, actually, which brings us nicely, is to improve the profession, right? And and really, what we are, the home of Scrum, is. You know, we do training certification, you know that. We have this amazing community of PST trainers, some of which are also Management 3.0 facilitators and, and trainers, which I think that's kind of the reason why we started talking. But what's interesting is that the, the, the a lot of our success now isn't dependent on us getting teams to understand how to do Scrum or getting Scrum Masters to be awesome. I mean, there are obviously challenges to that. It really is around the environment that those Scrum teams are, are working in. So. Uh, I, you know, brought Kurt into the organization to help lead that that work and to build relationships with fantastic thought leaders like Ralph and, and others to really start to help put content out and put materials out to, to solve that. And uh, as you know, you know, we here at Scrum.org were founded by Ken and, and Ken's, uh, Ken is continuously railing against the inability of organizations for, you know, to make Scrum successful and we are trying to do a lot around that. So, which brings us to, you know, Management 3.0. Do you want to just say a few words about who Management 3.0 is, um, yeah. yeah, Ralph. Got started uh, with the book Manager Point o, Leading Agile Developers, Developing Agile Leaders, written by Eric Aplow in 2010. And based on that book and the feedback that he got, he said, hey, people want to know more about it, they want to learn about how to apply those ideas. So that's how he developed the two-day Manager Point 3.0 Foundation Workshops. Uh, he also wrote a second book about uh, managing happiness. And the first book, some people find this a bit theoretical. The second book is much more practical. 
and that were the starting points those two books of Man 3.0 um, and nowadays we got 430 plus licensed facilitators all over the world from Japan to Mexico and from uh, Canada to uh, South Africa uh, 25,000 certified people who attended the workshops uh, we're starting with a support community for people who really like to be connected to the brand uh, and it's still growing and uh, it's now a lot more than just Jurgen Apollo nowadays. A uh, lot of facilitators are creating content, uh, as you said, uh, facilitators from Scrum.org, Cranes are connected to the brand. So it's it's growing and it's getting more popular. Yeah, I, thank you. I think one thing that's so refreshing about the ideas in Management 3.0 is, it, uh, yes, there's some conceptual ideas, but the majority of the stuff that you've produced, which I'm really, is practical. You can literally take this practice and do it. Now, whether it's a success, who knows? But you can at least do it and get going, and it, and the, and it makes things more transparent in teams, and it cre helps create that environment using these practices and the ideas behind management through that helps Scrum be more 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 successful. So so it's great to have you in it, and and the work you're doing awesome, and the diagrams that you create are both off scary in the case of this one, but also awesome as well. I love that. I think that just sums up management really. That that that. That picture. So now today's going to be a question and answer sort of uh, facilitated discussion between between Kurt and Ralph. And um, we've got some questions already in the hopper. I just want to remind everybody: feel free to add your questions to the to the question list. I'll try to bring them if if we have time. If we don't, you know, we'll see what we can do with them. But at the start, I think the question that's on everybody's mind, considering it's Scrum.org and Management 3.0 having a webinar, is um, managers are not mentioned in the Scrum Guide. Does that mean, you know, and some of our agile listers in the community say, first thing you have to do is fire all your managers, you know. So I guess, Kurt, you start this, and I'd love to hear your comments after that, Ralph. Kurt, what, you know, what, what does this mean? Is this right? Well, I, I think that I think of this in two ways. One is that the, the Scrum Guide deals with a very specific challenge around how do you help a team organize to get work done by the end of a sprint. And that's challenging enough without having to, to describe all of the different permutations of the organizations that those teams could work in. Um, but the, the thing that is really essential that we found, and I alluded to it before, is that um, Every team exists within some sort of context or within some sort of environment. And, and an environment is an organization that has a culture and that has processes and it has roles and it has human resources policies, as much as we don't like the word resources applied to humans, but it, it has all of these things. And what managers do is essentially they create and sustain that environment. Dave, we just lost the screen. Over. I know, I, I that was because somebody asked a question and I clicked on something. Sorry, sorry, Kurt, I know you're in the middle of okay. it. Sorry. Uh, but the important thing is that is that managers, in a sense, I, I like um, some some writings about um, the Toyota Way, Mike, Mike Rother's book, uh, the Toyota Kata book, um, is, is interesting because Toyota characterized the role of managers as essentially the carrier, carriers of the culture of the organization. And so, you know, if you think about the managers establishing the environment in which the scrum teams work, that environment can be supportive or it can be antagonistic. And so this role of the manager, and, and we'll, we'll talk about the difference between managers and leaders in a little bit, but, but it's, it's really important for the success of the teams. So, so, to the, the, so the bottom line is that it's not in the Scrum Guide primarily because the focus of the Scrum Guide is about delivering valuable software or delivering valuable products or delivering valuable stuff through the increment, et cetera, and how to organize around that. However, it's fundamentally needed, right? So, so Ralph, what, what's your take? Obviously, you know, a lot of the companies that you're working with are using Scrum or, or some sort of agile method. What do you get a pushback around just even the term management 3.0 in this post-industrial age? No, and I think it's a, one step back. It's about management and managers, and that's what we also talk about in 3.0. That we say that management is necessary. Uh, if you work in a small startup, you think about vision, you think about salaries, I assume, you think about hiring people, maybe firing people, and that's what we call management. But if you have a small startup of five people, I don't think you have managers. On your payroll. I mean, you do. You take care of yourself. 
I think that's a big difference that management is necessary, period. I mean, there's no organization without management. And nowadays with all new frameworks, all new videos, we call them tribe leads, chapter coaches, agile coaches, scrum masters, product owners, but all those people are taking care of management. So this is managers are needed. I don't know if managers are needed. We also believe that management can be done by a lot, a lot of people, and many people. It's not just managers. So managers needed, I don't know, could be. Management, definitely yes. It's just who is going to fill that role. And then we believe from entry point oh that everybody can take part of that management. Interesting. So so ultimately you're highlighting the difference between the discipline that is management, the skills necessary, the traits that you need as a as a person to do it, and the actual role manager. Um, the, is that needed? Is that not needed? Who knows? It depends on your situation, depends on your history, depends on your culture, which is similar to what you said, Kurt. But the actual, but the actual skills and the actual discipline is still incredibly important, which then nicely leads into, into oops, leads into the two screens. I'm having a nightmare. It leads into um, the question. So what does it mean then? I mean, are, is, are we talking about leadership here? Are we talking about management? Is there a difference? What does agile? Is there an agile manager? You know, that's very popular. In, in, in certain parts of the world, that, that that role, Agile Manager, is on LinkedIn and Monster and all those sites. Um, is it is it more about leadership? Firstly, what's the distinction? I, I, uh, Kurt, you, you mentioned earlier you were going to talk about this, the distinction between management and leadership. I think Ralph really summarized the essence of it when he talked about many, you know, anybody on the team can do management. Um, the, the leadership piece of it tends to be, in my mind, um, more about essentially helping guide, you know, wh whether it's, you know, working as a team, guiding toward a better future. Um, but the le leadership essentially to me has to do with um, where do we want to go? Who do we want to be? Um, how, how do we want to do those things? And helping to facilitate that discussion and helping to guide that discussion, helping to helping you know bring different perspectives to the table, um, creating a safe space in which people can have those kinds of discussions are, are all leadership kinds of things. So it's 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 less about, in a sense, the tactical things of who's doing what today or tomorrow or whatever, but but in a sense, what kind of people do we want to be? What kind of team do we want to be? What kind of organization do we want to be, be? What kind of product do we want to build? Who are we? Who do we want to build it for? And and all of those, you know, it's, it's essentially dealing with all the things that are completely undefined, um, and and helping to provide vision and structure to those kinds of things. It, to me, it's sort of the essence of of leadership. Um, it's 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 bringing a chaotic, ambiguous situation um, sort of into under, if not control, at least under, you know, bringing it into a into a condition where we can deal with that chaos and deal with that ambiguity. Mm. So uh, I, I know I've sort of waffled around the issue, but I, but I think that's what makes defining leadership difficult is because you're dealing largely with the intangible and largely with goals and aspirations, as opposed to sort of the day to day housekeeping kinds of things that management, in my mind, tends to deal with. So safety, direction, space, structure are some of the words you use to describe leadership. Ralph, what would you say, or firstly, do you think leadership and management are different? And secondly, what words would you use to describe management and management 3.0 type of management? Yeah, um, I, I agree with Kurt, uh, although I think that can also be done by management, so it's more some more the definition. And what does it mean to be an agile leader? I think everybody can be an agile leader also in his own area. I mean, if you're a developer, if you're a software tester, if you're a product owner, you can also develop a vision in, in where to go, how to develop your own area. So for me, it's not, there has to be not one agile leader in a team, but everybody can be a leader. Everybody should be a leader. Um, and the second question of you, Dave, was how is it related to Manager Point O? Yeah, what are, what are the words you would use? You know, uh, Kurt used safety, he used direction, he yes. used space, he used structure. Are they the same words that you would use or are there different words that sort of define management? 
Yeah, I would think about purpose, vision, uh, where to go, uh, lead by example. For me, a big thing is uh, that's what an agile leader should do. You should lead by example. You should be the first one that crosses the bridge, <laughs> and then other people can follow. But if you don't go, then why do you expect other people to go? Yeah, I, I think that's one really nice thing in the book that in the first book, uh, there was so many examples of, of Jürgen doing the things that he talked about. Um, not necessarily well sometimes. Sometimes I was thinking, well, I'm not sure I'd do it like that. But it, it, and they, that really did illustrate the environment that he was trying to create in, in the book. Hey, we've got a great question that sort of uh, the, from from uh, from Robert Robert Olivier, I think. I, I can't quite read from that distance, but um, how can we be part of? Uh, so, what does it mean? How can I be a good agile leader? Um, is it possible to be a good agile leader? We talked about the traits of leadership. We talked about the, the fact that there's a big intersection between that and, and management, uh, though there's obviously some practical stuff and management that sort of you have to do as well. Is, how do you be a good one, <laughs> a good agile leader? A good one. I think the most important thing for me is to take action, to do something explicitly, not just wait till things happen. I mean, I don't expect everybody to lead an organization, 10,000 people to be a good leader. I mean, as I said, in your team, you can be a leader. As long as you take action, you take initiative, you do something. You act on something that you see it was wrong. And in uh, some frameworks, I talk about tension, but that's maybe it is. If you see tension, if you notice something is wrong, something is weird, you should act. And that, I think, makes you already a great leader. And you don't have to resolve the problem yourself, but at least bring it to the table and make an explicit table, an ex explicit problem that you can discuss it. Just don't let it happen. And then looking back, oh, gee, that happened to us. Interesting. We talk a lot about Scrum, the Scrum Master role, and I, I and there's been a number of questions about that role, about that the sort of connection with leadership. But the sort of one thing that's so important for the Scrum Master role is making things transparent. So when you say act, you don't necessarily mean do stuff in terms of because that can be quite disruptive and actually underpower the team. You mean sort of make if you see problems, make them visible, right? Make a visit and at least have somebody take action, at least bring them to the table. Exactly. Kurt, what, what, do, what do you think about leadership and what makes a good one? Uh, yeah, to, to build on top of what Ralph said, I think you know, it, that taking action is really important. And what, what's different with an agile leader versus a traditional leader is that the traditional leader might, you know, wants to take action, but their action is mostly in terms of telling other people what to do. You know, you need to do this, we need to do that, you know, so-and-so needs to do this, maybe they do some things themselves. So uh, I, I look at the, the role of the Agile leader as, as sort of being twofold, is that one is that they, they identify some different place where the team or the organization needs to be, but then the real difference, and so that, that happens in traditional leadership as well, but the, the difference in, with, an agile approach is that they then have to figure out how do they help the team move to that new place. And so, you know, what, what weaknesses perhaps does the team need to address and how can they help them address those weaknesses or what impediments do they need to face? Or maybe what, um, you know, new skills does the team need and, and helping them to develop those new skills. So it's, it's essentially, um, getting other people engaged in that problem of moving the organization instead of taking all the weight of the change on themselves and, and then directing the team or, or the rest or, or a larger organization to get there. So it's this, you know, yes, they identify a new place to be or a new, new goal to achieve, but then, you know, they engage with other people when necessary. Now, R Ralph mentioned, you know, any individual on the team could be a leader and and if and it could be a leader in their own skills and improving their own skills and in that case they don't maybe don't need to engage other people although they may need to ask other people for help or they may need to collaborate with other people to improve the skills but increasingly as as the scope of that leadership in, increases then the then they're they're increasingly helping other people to get to a new place instead of um, simply directing so yeah. there's there's a 
there's a thread of questions around Scrum Master. Obviously, no surprise, eh? Scrum.org. Thank you. Uh, we did kind of invent it with with um, with, Je uh, with Jeff. Uh, so the term was coined. Um, is that the, both what you said, Kurt and Ralph, sounded ridiculously like the role of a Scrum Master. And um, that doesn't mean that, you know, I mean, on any good scrum team, everybody's got a little scrum master <laughs> in them, as well as actually a person being a scrum master, um, you know, to sort of spread that the, 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 the pain out a little bit. But it is can a agile, is it an agile manager? Is a scrum master an agile manager stroke agile leader? Um, sort of, I mean, part of it, I think, I mean, if you look at salaries, if you look at uh, rewards, incentives, that's also part of management. Yep. Is that the world of Scrum Master? Some say yes. Some say that Scrum Master can fire hire people on team. Some say no, it's something somebody else should do. Uh, develop competence. Is that something that Scrum Master should do? I mean, there are different opinions about it. So I don't think there's one answer to cover everything that, that explains everything. And some organizations, Scrum Masters will be responsible for or helping people to develop their competences make skill because you want to improve your team. Some organizations they work with, as they call the chapter coaches, people are totally focused on improving, helping people improve themselves. So uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. I mean, it's a bit of a consultancy answer, I understand that. <laughs> but it depends also a bit on the culture of the company. And I think, yes, yeah, sometimes the Scrum Master takes part of the agile management role. Uh, and sometimes they don't, but it really depends per organization. It also depends per Scrum Master how experienced he is and what his Reference are what? What does he like? What does she like? Mm, yeah, I, I think, uh, and this was where just a lot of people asking this. I just this was from Diana, um, who 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 uh, sort of like kicked off this this discussion. One thing that's really interesting that you said, Ralph, and I, I'd love your comment on this, Kurt. So one of the biggest challenges, like, can a Scrum Master fire somebody from the team? That's always a classic. Um, it's actually a question that we ask in in many of our tests uh, because it's a it, it's really illustrative of 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 the thinking around it not the actual practicality because it's a role versus a job description and all this kind of stuff but one thing that's interesting is that tension and I'd love your comment on uh, this Kurt and then Ralph if you anything is this tension between transparency it's very hard to be honest with somebody that pays your salary that gives your promotion that reviews you that you report to it's very hard to be transparent. I mean, it's possible, but it takes a lot of effort on both sides to make that, create that environment. It's much easier to be transparent with a peer, right? It's much mm. easier to do that. So how do you deal with that tension between transparency and that, those, some of those management things that, you, that Ralph called out? Let's Kurt, what, what, how do you deal with that? Or do you? Well, I think that you're you're really sort of summarizing the, the essence of the problem with having a, a manager who has people reporting responsibilities from being an effective scrum master. Um, so I'll deal with that, and then we can deal with the, the more general question. Um, but so but you're right. There's there's always this tension um, when you report to somebody. You you want to do things to please them. You don't want to look bad. You um, and and the Scrum Master to be effective really needs to have full transparency on the team. And so if they have, you know, people management responsibilities, they are not just out of just the way our brains work. Um, they're probably not going to get the kind of transparency that is really going to help people develop. They're going to, you know, potentially hear what uh, people want them to hear. So, you know, the, the Scrum Master sort of to, to generalize the, the discussion you know, they're responsible for helping the team do Scrum well, you know, and to, you know, improve their skills and to provide feedback. And, you know, it's it's difficult for them to do that if they if they're, have people management responsibilities. Um, not impossible, but, you know, the odds are, are probably stacked against them to be really effective. Um, so they might be able to be very effective as a scrum master for a different group of people that they that don't report to, to them, but they but within the people that they work that work for them, um, very very challenging. And the other problem that that you often have when you're transitioning to different roles is that you often carry the baggage of your old role. So you keep that even if you want to work differently, people keep reacting to you in the same way that you know if they're 
if they're in the same role that you were in before. Um, so, uh, but I, I think you're, you're, you're on to the thing is that you, you really need to have transparency. There has to be trust. There has to be, um, you know, the, uh, essentially a, 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 the people need to view the scrum master as, as, um, as being someone who will help them versus someone who will judge them. And yeah. so all of those things contribute to my, my general feeling is that having a people manager be a scrum master is a really bad idea. I mean, yes, sir. I mean, ultimately, yeah. sort of highlighted the tension. It's not impossible, but it's difficult and it adds, it makes it harder. Ralph, you know, this is a classic management includes these things. You just said it. You have to have somebody that worries about HR, reviews, promotion, all that stuff, the people side or the resource historically side, or the HR side to the thing. Uh, who should do that in this new age then? Should it, should it be? Is it, or, or is it, a, it depends, the right answer? No, it doesn't depend. My, my first answer would be the team itself, the company itself. Interesting. But of course, theory is different than uh, real life. I understand that. But if you look at point out, we as a company, we don't have managers. We don't have people who tell us what to do. We take care of everything ourselves. We give each other feedback about what we like and what we don't like. We discuss and decide on our own salaries. Um, but for doing that, and that's also what Kurt mentioned already said, you need transparency, you need to have trust, and that's so important. And having an organization where different kind of people take up different kind of management activities, let's call it like that, you need to have trust in each other. And I totally understand if you have an organization of a thousand people and you don't want to make a swift uh, shift to that kind of organization where people take care of those kind of things themselves, it will be hard. Mm. And if you read the books about Morningstar, uh, Patagonia, all those kind of companies, they did it from the start off. From day number one, they did it like that. And changing an existing culture, I mean, I don't know if it's possible. It will take years. <laughs> one of the tools that I, I really like, um, so Management 3.0, and Ralph should be the one talking about this, and he can tell the story better than I can. But one of the tools that I really like is this delegation board tool. Um, that basically, um, uh, well, a team can use it within within themselves, or you can use it between sort of a traditional manager and the team to work out, you know, what what in a sense, what authority are you willing to give? What authority are you willing to take on? Um, a team might say, you know, especially one that's tran transitioning to Scrum but very inexperienced. Might might say, and I've heard them say this, that oh, you know, we're we're, we're self managing, we can do anything we want, mm -hmm. and the manager might say, well, no, not really. We we have you know legal human resources you know requirements that we have to meet. We have other other things that we have to do. Um, maybe we, we you're a small pocket in a in a much larger organization, and I can only bend the rules so much. So um, you know, there's a give and take there. You know, the team might want to take on more responsibility and, and then working with management, they, they work out how they get there, what evidence they might need to provide that says that they're ready to take on that responsibility. And as Ralph said, at a very high level of performance um, and capability and competency, they might do all their own performance reviews. They might determine their salaries themselves. They might determine bonuses. They, they might do all of these things. But would, would an immature or, or a, a team new to Scrum that, that doesn't have trust and transparency and, and experience be able to do those things? Uh, you know, it, it, it's hard to say absolutely not, but pretty close. Um, and so, so I, I like, you know, having a tool like that delegation board to discuss what, what you think you're ready for and what the other person thinks you're ready for. And, and it's not that there's any magic in the technique, but, but I like it as a discussion. Uh, it's really useful. I think what you're highlighting is the fact that one, it highlights what the responsibilities are. I mean, Ralph, as you as you well know, you were sort of alluding to it. There's things that people don't at a startup, having done a startup, there was things that we didn't know until we knew we didn't know them, you know? Then we we're like, oh my God, we have to do this. There's legal things. Oh my gosh, I didn't know. And suddenly, you know, getting that populating that board with a 
shared understanding of what needs to be done and legally and you know etc cetera, etc cetera, really is incredibly powerful and then having those explicit conversations Kurt, is what you're saying around who does what who's responsible and and obviously the delegation board and and the techniques around that and that's a, a great section in the materials from 3.0 management 3.0 is 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 awesome uh, did you, did you at, at management 3.0 as an organization Ralph you use that I assume to help to work out who does what you know who's responsible etc good question and we did not prepare this one um, we, tried. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> we tried to use the delegation board uh, last year in Dublin when we had our team retreat uh, but we came to the conclusion that the delegation board doesn't work if you don't have a manager <laughs> oh. so our team doesn't have any managers and level one is the manager tells the team what to do so if you don't have a manager who tells the team then what to do is then the whole team tells itself what to do so we noticed that the delegation board, I love this tool, and often when I work with clients, I use this tool to make things visible, exactly as you said, that they get the things straight, what are the areas that we're talking about, what are the delegations. But at one moment, you need to have a new tool, and we're working on a tool or something like that that can replace it. And that could be a great tool if you have a team that's really self-controlling, self-steering, and you still need to make decisions, because they need to decide, okay, how are we going to make decisions in our team? Is it just the one who shouts out loud, or is it just the one who takes advice, or are we going to do it? So we tried to use the delegation mode, and we did. We, we wrote a blog post about it. You can find it on the site of Manage.0. But now working on a new tool that can replace this, let's call a refactored uh, delegation board, and replace it with something new that really fits the team without management, hmm. without managers, I should say. Interesting. So that that brings me. I mean, most of the people that are online today, you know, the the the, the people that are listening today, and obviously this is going to be recorded. So I don't know if that's going to be true of you that listen on a recording, but uh, are asking, you know, well, but my world isn't like that, Ralph. It's not. We have managers. We have we have more managers than know what to do with. You know, when in doubt, there's a the manager. You know, um, uh, to some extent because we're, promotions structure. So we're transitioning from the industry. I like to talk about transitioning from the industrial age to the digital age or whatever age we're moving into. Um, that means that the reality is that the environment that these scrum teams and these scrum masters and these managers and these project managers are working in is actually not one or the other. It's kind of the worst of both, probably. So how do you, I mean, how do you transition? How do you manage in this way? The interesting part is they are already using Scrum, so they already realize that product development is a complex project. You can't yeah. control it. And then managing an organization where you work with people, and people are even more complex than software development, they do think that they can manage that in a traditional way. That's a bit weird, so that's a bit of a contradiction. So how do you make that transition? Um, one thing that I always mention to managers and to boards is, okay, you have those employees, you hire them, qualified people, uh, and they have homes, they got mortgages, they got kids, they got cars, insurances, they pick a holiday every year with the whole family, they make big decisions at home. And then they step into your office and then you assume that they can't do anything anymore, you need to protect them from everything, that's weird. Why did you hire those people? So I think that the first step is making people aware of it, and of course if you use Scrum you can also use the complex environment uh, approach to explain that hey, organizations are also complex adaptive systems. And then just take it step by step. And the delegation board, again, is a great tool to do this because you don't have to delegate everything to your teams. You can do it step by step. The teams can gain trust from the managers. And then at one moment, hey, they can do it. I mean, you got to practice kudokas to give each other compliments. That could be a great step for introducing a new kind of bonus system where people give kudokas. And you can see, hey, they give each good kudokas and they are really um, doing it well. They really give good kudos. So maybe we can also change the bonus system slowly. I mean, you don't have to do everything in day one because it won't work. But step by step, take the organization by the hand to become this new organization. Wow. So actually, I think you highlighted something, Ralph, that I just want to make very clear that, that many of the techniques, practices that Management 3.0 um, teaches and that's in the books and available are very much transitional techniques because what they do is they make things, as Kurt described at the delegation board, they make things visible, you, then you make explicit choices about how far you go down one way or the other. 
and by doing that you ultimately incrementally change the culture of the the organization and maybe one question that you already got or somebody asked how do i scale up with management 2.0 that's a question that often get how do i scale up to 10,000 people and i thought about it and then i realized not you don't scale up because a lot of things in management 2.0 are about transparency about trust you need to trust each other if you in the end you're going to decide on your own salaries you need to have a certain level of trust. And if you have an organization of 10,000 people, it's hard to trust 9,999 people. <laughs> so you need to keep your organization small. Uh, business units of 50, 100, 150 people, that's the maximum. And then maybe see, hey, can we split it up? Can we make a new business unit, a new unit, whatever? Wow. That well, that I mean, that's controversial. Uh, you're obviously saying that organizations have a finite size, which is what you're saying in this new world, and that you need to somehow, that doesn't mean you can't still be a big company, but inside it, you would have a, whether you call them tribes, whether you call them, I don't know, business units, whether you call them studios, you would have these different mechanisms, and potentially the culture inside those units would be unique. To those units or those tribes yeah. or those whatever. Kurt, do, do you agree? Do you think? I mean, obviously, uh, John Cotter talks about this in a similar way in his um, uh, in his latest book. To, do you agree that that the 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 only way you scale these ideas is incremental, and at a certain point, it reaches because of the trust element, it reaches a certain finite size. Um. So. There's certainly some evidence of organizations that are quite large that seem to be fairly agile. Um, so I, I think that there's most of the organizations that I've seen be successful, um, it's the, this agility exists within a particular product or it exists within a particular group. Um, I, I haven't personally seen any organizations which are 100% agile across the board. And, and some of that's because not all of what, it, what a large organization does is in what we would call the complex domain. So there's, there's lots of things that maybe you don't need to be agile. But the practices that, that we're talking about, about having teams be more self-organizing and, and to take on greater responsibility and use greater transparency and those sorts of things, they can be applied to almost anything. So, not, you know, areas where Scrum doesn't, you know, maybe typically isn't typically thought of. So you could use it in a marketing department, or you could use it in, um, in, in, a, in a legal department, or you could use it in, you know, scientific research. So we've seen all of those things. Um, the, the one thing that I, I wanted to sort of pivot a little bit, um, because it, I think it, it's sort of relevant to the, the scaling problem is that, the so I, I find the most critical sort of aha moment for an agile leader is essentially a moment of humility when they realize that they don't know everything they don't even know enough to really tell other people how to work and so if you think about it, let's pick the software example is that you know, a, a software development manager does not know enough to tell a, you know, site reliability engineer how to do their job or how to do, uh, or how a developer, how to do their job. So, and, and, and that's true of almost everything. You know, it's true in, in, a, in a, you know, even in factories where, you know, maybe the factory foreman, they have a vague idea about how the job is done, but they actually don't, unless they come up through the ranks and done the job, they, they haven't done it. And even then it changes. So it's changed since they used to do it. So I think that the first real step is that the limitation on scaling is really a limitation that we have in our minds about how we work. And so the first thing that, that an agile leader needs to do is have a certain degree of self-awareness, recognize that, that they don't really know how to do this stuff, but they do know a lot of, a lot of things that can help a team. And, they, they know, so, so for example, you know, um, I, I've been scanning some of the questions and one of the questions that was interesting was, um, you know, well, isn't the scrum master supposed to basically provide this environment in which the team works and all that? And yes, within a certain degree of scope, but there's lots of things that aren't in the control of the scrum master. 
you know, like organizational policies or maybe dealing with shareholders or, you know, dealing with other people. So, so these, these leaders in different, you know, so we, we talked before, anybody could be a leader. So if, you know, each, each leader has some little bit of expertise that they know how to help with. So in a sense, it's an extension of, of the team is the same way, you know, now everybody on the team can do the same job, but everybody has a bit that they can do to contribute. So the, the challenge for the leader is to basically, you know, start with humility and then um, say, what can I do to help here? And, and then start to think of, and, and using that to change their attitude about how they work with people and recognize the limit of their own, their own ability. So this sort of extends from that idea of the delegation board is that the manager, you know, has things that they're doing today that maybe they're not, they're not the best person to do that. Mm. And maybe they need to find who the best person is and help them to do the job. So, so I think it, it, you know, everybody, you know, needs to come up with a, a approach to this with a certain degree of humility, a certain degree of self-awareness, and then say, how can I help, you know, achieve, help us as a group achieve our goal? Um, and is there a limit to scaling that? I don't know, probably not, but you know, you have to start with a team, you know, an individual team working together to achieve something and, and then go from there. Maybe it's then adding teams or maybe it's expanding the scope of what, what your mission is. Okay. So, um, I realize we are moving on for the questions, so I should probably move on to some of these other questions. We've sort of talked about authority, uh, to help a team grow. Um, but th this is an interesting sort of question and then there's, there's some interesting questions about metrics which I'll come to in a second but I, I do want to talk a little bit more about this authority relationship because it sounds Ralph and Kerr and you've you talked about delegation board and that the, the managers are giving up authority why would we want to we've spent our whole lives trying to get to this position where people listen to us you know and obviously most of us are, many of us are married so it doesn't always happen when we're at home but the but we're at work people damn listen to us right so how does how does authority where does it fit in this new world i think it's a mind shift uh if you have a team that you're a manager of a team lead whatever you want to call yourself and in the end the team can do everything without you I believe the team will do a better job than you, when you did it before, before the, before the team. Because yeah. the team has more knowledge, they got nine, seven, I don't know how many people in the team, they got more knowledge, more experience together, they will come up with better solutions. So if you give your authority to the team and you help them to grow their knowledge in the areas that they need to grow, they will make a better product, they will make better decisions. And in the end, and that's important, you as a manager, you're accountable. And a different team, performs very well, they make great decisions, then also you're accountable for their success and you will get a new team to do the same trick again. So I think that's in for them. It will give you recognition that you're a great manager because you did it. You made the team better just by putting them on the front line of work. So, you, so you're basically saying as long as you're ultimately motivated by the ultimate success of whatever this team is responsible for delivering, whether it's a marketing campaign, a new product, whatever, that, that ultimately that this model will make you more successful. Therefore, this traditional authority won't help. But it sounds a bit scary, right, Ralph? I mean, you've got to kind of like, you call it a mind shift. It's a sort of like, it's a bit risky. I mean, I have two small children at home. There's many times I give up traditional authority to them and many times I'm disappointed by them. So, um, you know, is this is this wrong? The other way around. If you would make all decisions for them, will they have grown up as to become good adults? Uh, yeah, but it's that scary moment, yeah, right? And that's, that's the thing about trust. I mean, as a manager, you need to give trust to the team. And I've been, I've been a manager and it's difficult. It's scary because I know one thing, when I do it myself, I know, I think it will be done better, but at least I know how it will be done. I'm not saying it is better. I don't think it's better in the end, but I know he's, I got control. And you need to give up control and that's scary. Thank and if you don't want to do it, then yeah, don't give it up. But then I think your team will not perform as best as they can. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the analogy with um, with sports teams is interesting um, and, and also dangerous to extend too far. But if we look at the role of a coach on a sports team, they're not actually doing the work of the team. They're helping the team to improve. So they have the insight. 
they know enough of the of skills and the performance capabilities of the individuals, and they can also see how the team works together. But you know, in many cases, a coach, you know, a great coach wasn't necessarily a great individual player. And 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 even and today, most coaches, you know, they couldn't, they they're too old. They they couldn't go out and play at the level of of their team. But you know, we, we have yet to really evident, see evidence of a 100% self-managing sports team that's won a major championship. There's always a coach. And, and, and what I think the difference is, uh, or, or the analogy to, to management is that, you know, someone outside the team who's helping the team observe where their capabilities are can help that team to improve in ways that the team itself can't see. We all have blind spots. You know, we, we have, uh, you know, we have these cognitive biases that, you know, where, you know, we might think we're wonderful, but in reality, we're not, you know, we're, we're, we have areas to improve. So for someone who has the trust of, uh, of the, the, the people on the team to give them honest feedback, to help them improve, it is usually really appreciated. You know, a great, a great a sign of a great coach is that the team members themselves think that the coach really helps them to achieve better things. So it's it's not the, the coach dictating saying, do this, you go here, you do that, but rather, you know, most of most coaching happens in, in essentially training, not not actually on game day. So um, I, I you know again there are dangers of extending the, the sports analogy too far. But I think that that analogy to think about the the evolution of the manager to more of a, a coach and facilitator and someone who helps people develop and helps them, them reach their true potential is, is more where I think the, the, the sort of where leaders want to get or need to get. Mm, interesting. Obviously, as a Leicester City football fan, uh, where we won the championship with perhaps the most self-organizing and certainly the cheapest team in the Premier League, I would like to attest to traditional authority. The, yeah, it's amazing when you give it up and how empowered the team is. Unfortunately, then it's very hard for the next coach to come along because they they understanding their role in that team that's function fully functional is very, very, very challenging as proven by Leicester City. Sorry, don't mean to rat hole on Leicester, even though it's the greatest football team ever. Um, so so there's, there's lots of questions around metrics. So, you know, traditional, you're giving up authority, your team's growing. How do you measure it? How, how do you measure in this new world? Um, you know, Ralph, the, 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 the how do you measure to the to the success? I mean, surely there's you've got to make things transparent to help you make the right decisions to point us in the right direction. How, what are the measures that make sense? Yeah, I mean, measurement, yes, yeah, still also an agile organization, you measure stuff. I mean, if you don't measure anything, you don't know where you're going. So that's still necessary. I think the big difference uh, with traditional organizations is that you disconnect your measurements from your rewards. You disconnect metrics from money. You disconnect metrics from bonuses. So the moment that they are connected to each other, people will gain the system, people will make the bonus the target, and therefore the metric a target. So I think that's the biggest difference that you have to do. Uh, in Management 3.0, we have two practices. We talk about OKRs, invented by John Deere. Yeah, uh, that we explain to people. It's about stretching organization, learning objectives, and not punishing people, not rewarding people based on what they realize. And it still gives you good insight. Are you on the right track? We got a scoreboard index. That's another practice where you just collect a number of uh, metrics and you just see them over time. What is the trend? Are they going up? And you combine a lot of things. And it goes too far for this webinar, but we have 12 guidelines that we think should be connected to good metrics. And that's, for example, don't connect them to rewards. Uh, uh, experiment, change your metrics, because we all know those metrics, those reports, that after five months we can send them again to our manager and nobody sees the difference. <laughs> yeah, so, I... The metrics are still possible and it should be transparent and you should show people what you measure, but still in agile organization is necessary to measure stuff. You, you, you want to know if you're improving. It should be focused on improving. 
Yeah, and that and the point about the transparency that's reduced when it's connected to rewards because rewards instantly mean you're concentrating. Yeah, everybody wants to buy that new car. Everybody wants to go on that better holiday, right? So yeah. if suddenly they're like, "Well, my God, I can get twenty thousand more dollars if I just gain it in this way," then they will do that. I remember the classic um, uh, Dilbert thing is, you know, we're going to pay everybody on the lines of code, and Dilbert turns around and says, "I'm going to build my." a minivan and, <laughs> and and I think that just really sums up metrics in that way Kurt I mean you know what 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 sort of OKRs you I know you're a big fan as well what type of OKRs would you expect to see in an agile organization that would help to, to deliver this change but well, I think the first thing is is to look at <clears throat> what are you trying to achieve and so we we like to and it's it's uh, too long to, to go into it here, but we, we have this framework called evidence-based management, which we recently done a webinar. I encourage you to watch that. But the key idea behind it is that you want to focus on what outcomes you want to achieve, what value are you actually delivering to usually customers, but sometimes other, other people in the organization outside your own team. Um, and so, you know, by looking at what outcomes you want to achieve and, and how effectively you achieve that as a team, you have a much better idea of where you might need to improve. Um, so, you know, outcomes and impacts are more important than traditionally we've looked at activities and outputs. So we've looked at, you know, how, how much work do we think we did and how, how long did it take and how much did it cost? And basically all of those things are irrelevant if it didn't produce any value. So shifting around to focus on value uh, is, is really kind of the first thing. Um, and then using, using that, um, you know, did we as a team, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm using the team example, I'm not talking about management, judging a team, but as a team, you know, we have this hypothesis that if we did this, we'd see this result. Did we see that? You know, if we didn't see that, we shouldn't look at that as a bad thing. We actually learned something. Um, so, you know, looking at, did you produce, you know, did your, your hypotheses or experiments um, work out the way you, you thought they would? If they didn't, that's, that's not a bad thing. You know, you, you, so, so focusing on learning and improvement as opposed to sort of judging and punishing. Um, so, you know, too much of traditional management focuses on adherence to a plan. But who has any idea whether that plan was any good? It was just something somebody made up. And so, you know, what you really want to do is tease out, take the plan, which has a bunch of unstated assumptions in it, tease them out, make them into experiments, and, and then decide, well, how are we going to measure if we actually achieve that? And using those measures to drive behaviors. So, you know, rewarding a team on the value that they deliver, great idea. Um, Rewarding them on some artificial adherence to a plan, you know, well, if you had somebody who was omniscient who created the plan, that might be a good idea, but, you know, we're all human, we all make mistakes, we all have, have uh, you know, sort of uh, things that we believe that aren't true. So it's much better, I, I believe, in the interest of transparency, focus on value, you know, be transparent about your assumptions, validate those assumptions, and, and, and then, you know, re but, but reward the, goal, the real things that you're trying to achieve, like, delivering value to customers. Mm, agreed. And I love the, you know, what Ralph said about making it visible, scoreboards, you know, making everything very visible is, is, is crucial. All right. So we're coming up to the end of our time. And we could talk for, for days on this topic. Um, hopefully the audience, uh, you know, you've found this interesting. We've got a couple of minutes before the end. I just would like to give you an opportunity. So we, you know, we've sort of mirandered over the, you know, what is agile leadership, the role of an agile leader. We've talked a lot about transparency. We talked a lot about trust. We talked a lot about, you know, we talked a lot about the environment, creating the space. Um, a delegation uh, uh, doesn't necessarily connect to authority, you know, sort of like you don't delegate authority, you delegate stuff which ultimately allows you to deliver more value and be more successful in, in your role. We talked also about the tension um, between the sort of like the new world and the old world and, and how many of the practices at Management 3.0 can help you sort of navigate this, even if it doesn't necessarily solve some of these problems, um, which, is, which is interesting. Um, yeah, 
what summary I'd, I'd love like just a, a quick summary from both of you about practical how do people get started you know in this in this sort of new way of thinking you know i i, I, I ralph do you want to start you know what what is next step for everybody uh, the next step, uh, of course, do the workshop, etc. But that's more commercial. The next step <laughs> of is course, just, yes, do all your, well, yeah, the workshops, yes. But, but, but apart from that, out. I mean, try things out. I mean, in one of the books that I read uh, is there are three options if you don't like things. I mean, you can accept it. Hey, this is this. You can't change it. You can try to change it, or you can leave. Those are the three options that you have. But let's first try to change it, and let's first first try to change your company culture. Do small things, step by step, every day. And in the beginning, we talked about experimentation, experimenting and learning a failure. It will be part of the journey, and that will make it fun. Sometimes it will make it hard, but learning and just trying things out, adapting, I think that's all what you need to do. I love that message. Try stuff. You know, what's the worst that can happen, eh? <laughs> Try stuff. Kurt, have you anything to add uh, to your summary? I think to tie together a couple of things that we've talked about, um, one is Ralph made a great point that, you know, in our own personal lives and everyone's personal life, we, 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 we do incredibly complex things. And so I think the first thing to do is both as a team member uh, or if you're a manager or a leader is, is to recognize that, that there's hidden potential in every person to, to sort of do amazing things because they do those amazing things in their own lives. Um, the second thing is to then have a more open conversation about how can we work better towards a goal? You know, what things, in a sense, you know, if you're an individual, what things could I take on that would help my team or that would help me develop? You know, if you're a manager to say, you know, what, what things could I give up um, to enable the team to do better? Or what things, maybe more importantly, so here, here's a good example, I know we're about out of time, is that most managers... Um, if you ask them, you know, you know, of all the things that they do, you know, which things do they really love and which things do they not love? Well, you know, look at the things you don't love and say, am I really the best person to be doing those things? So you, by giving up things, you can free yourself up to do even greater things that might be more enriching for you. So I, I think it's, it's really, you know, sort of recognize the, the potential in everyone. And the second is, is to really start having an open conversation about who's the right person to do these things and, and then help to, you know, work together to sort that out. Okay. Well, thanks, gentlemen. Kurt, Ralph, I appreciate you taking the time today to talk to everybody and, and to share some of these ideas. Um, as uh, Ralph said, I'm going to quickly whiz to the to the last slide that I'm going to be sending these out. So you'll see there's lots of questions that we didn't get to. Um, Make sure, you know, as uh, the, the, obviously there's learning paths on scrum.org, which bring up lots of this stuff that you might find very interesting. Uh, and there's also a, an agile leader learning path that you might find useful. Um, become a Management 3.0 supporter. Lots of materials there for you to download. Lots of great materials and also some amazing cartoons, um, which is which is great. And of course, you know, there's opportunity, the, the, the workshop, uh, which Ralph mentioned mentioned before. Uh, and you can also connect with Management 3.0 and add more content, help them get better as well. And obviously connect with Scrum.org and help us get better every day. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. My name is Dave West. Um, today's been interesting. I've learned a few things and some other great stories to share with, uh, with my uh, friends and family afterwards. Uh, and um, have, a, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.